Um, thanks for coming. We're going to talk about some telephone pretexting and tricking people and doing all sorts of evil shit. I mean, stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Steins. Um, I'm a pen tester at Rapid7. Uh, we, we do um, telephone pretexting gigs frequently throughout the year. A couple of things I would say is that there's sort of some things I've noticed over time with particularly with telephone pretexting from a pen testing perspective it kind of has a tendency to be like the redheaded stepchild like it comes up and everyone's like god dang it I really don't want to make these phone calls and there's certain things I've learned from making my own errors and making my own mistakes that I just wanted to share with sort of the community um, to hopefully make getting involved with telephone pretexting a little bit easier, um, lower that entry barrier, and getting um, folks to pwn other folks over the phone um, like it's 1989 again. So, uh, going into sort of in that same vein, whenever we're talking about telephone pretexting, I'm talking about it specifically from a perspective of pen testing, meaning there's a master services agreement that's been signed, there's a statement of work that's in place, there's contractual agreements that are between the customer and yourself saying that you're authorized to do what you're doing. Uh, otherwise, you'll get in trouble, like i.e. go to jail. The, the idea is with malicious intent is how the law is written for both uh, telephone pretexting as well as spoofing caller ID. Now, that's a, not just a crime, it's a federal offense, meaning like you'll go to jail and possibly prison, like federal prison. So serious shit, be careful, do it only if you're authorized to do it to the folks that you're authorized to call. So now that we got that out of the way, let's, let's move on to some fun stuff. A big reason why um, I've seen a lot of folks really hesitant to get involved with some of the telephone pretexting and a lot of this type of social engineering and stuff is because they're nervous, right? I'll be honest with you, I've made thousands of calls, I still get nervous. Some folks, they, they don't get nervous, you know, they're, you know, Tony Robbins can probably go up on stage and he doesn't have like an ounce of nervousness in his entire body. Of course, he's probably prepared a lot, but like, I'm not Tony Robbins, I'll prepare all that I can and I'm still like, uh, like trembling just a tad, like, what if they find out, you know? <laughs> like there's nothing to find out, but it's just you get in your head or whatever. Uh, they say with public speaking, some people would rather die than talk in public, right? Raise your hand if you've done some form of telephone pretexting before on an engagement with a customer. Okay, now hands down, same folks that just raised your hands. Do you feel the same nervousness whenever you're making phone calls as you do when you're public speaking? I sure as hell do. Um, and I mean, for the folks that, that agree with me, everyone's different, obviously. Everyone has like different things that they get nervous, nervous about. With this in particular, whenever I prepare properly, just like I would do for a speech, that nervousness, it's still there a little bit, but it's more so channeled into a way that will help better my pretexts. So for, again, it's kind of 50-50. This is very in alignment with results I've seen from other folks who never asked them the same question. It's usually about middle of the road. Half people like will be like, yeah, that's exactly how I feel too. And other people are just, you know, they're just, again, maybe, um, completely malicious and just kind of like psychopathic or something and they just <laughs> enjoy genuinely uh, uh, ripping people off and stuff like that. I'm totally kidding. But um, again, everyone is different though. <laughs> so a couple of those things for people like me, again, that gets nervous, it's like things such as it, uh, rejection, judgment, and inad inadequacy. So I think a lot of it comes from if I do a telephone pretext, I get burned by the customer the customer narks on me, then my pretext is burned, and then the point of contact is going to judge me for having like a crappy pretext or something like that. I mean, it's, I'm going way out on the limb, but it's these types of things I feel like that kind of trigger some of those nervousness whenever you're doing pretexting. So being outcome independent is another thing that you're going to want to strive to do. And we'll talk about some other areas where you can, where you can sort of get around this nervousness and unease. Um, but outcome independence is one that I found that's very good for bypassing some of that nervousness and making you kind of just be present in the moment with your pretext and being more effective. Um, yeah, and like I mentioned earlier, I've done a few calls myself and the nervousness is still there, but learning how to channel that nervousness into an effective way to increase the likelihood of getting people to do what you want them to do is a great way of adjusting and dealing with that nervousness. 
Um, so we'll dive into what I'm calling here the millennial problem. With the millennial problem, we now have like the advent of like the smartphone headphones, noise, noise canceling headphones to really block out interactions with other people. Um, has kind of triggered us to not really engage with folks like we would used to. Like I remember growing up in the 90s, if you wanted to like call your buddy to like come over and hang out, you had to pick up the phone and just like call him. You know, now it's just like you're texting or you're just like, hey bro, like you're on Slack, like kick him over and hang out. Um, another thing also with this is this isn't necessarily with millennials in particular, but um, our just general social conditioning. Growing up. Our parents tell us, don't talk to strangers and don't lie to people. Whenever we're doing telephone pretexting, what are we doing? <laughs> Talking to strangers and we're freaking lying to people. We're doing two things that we're, that we're not comfortable with doing. So it's no wonder that we feel nervous. There's no wonder that we at least feel uncomfortable that whenever we're making these phone calls, we're not that congruent with what we're talking about. We might sound nervous. And then what happens with that is that will translate to your target the incongruence will translate to your target that something's not right. And if they sense that, they're immediately suspicious and they're not going to believe what you're t trying to tell them, trying to communicate to them. So uh, it's, it's really important to understand that we are, as a society, conditioned to deal, or I'm sorry, conditioned to go against doing some of these types of things. So the sooner that you can understand that and the sooner that you can kind of channel that into something that will help you out um, whenever you're actually making the calls. Um, another one is whenever you're vishing, telephone pretexting, cold, you're also setting yourself up for failure. When I was, when I was in college, uh, I went to school at Texas State. It was kind of a big time party school. Like, I'd be like partying my ass off on like Saturday and I would roll in. I worked at Best Buy at the time. I sold TVs. High ambitions, right? Uh, sold TVs at Best Buy. And I always had to open on Sundays. Sundays were like the day that I had to come in at like 8 a.m. super early. And like I'd be like strolling in. I'd walk through the door just like there's like bubbles popping around my head and like the birds flying above my head like this. And uh, just like walk in. I'm like turning on the TV is doing all the, the stuff or whatever to get started for the day. And, uh, you know, inevitably there's always that old dude that would walk in. He'd like walk up to the, like the 70 inch plasma TV, the heaviest one there, and he'd be just kind of standing there like this. Like, it's like, oh, cool. I'm like, of course, who's got to go talk to him? I'm the only guy there. Um, that and my manager. So I walk over, I'm just like, like, what's up, bro? Like, checking out this TV. He's like, yeah, man, it's a pretty good TV there. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, cool. Like, you want to buy it or what? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> such a shitty employee. That was the worst. So uh, <laughs> he's like, I would, I would just wait for the answer. No, I'm just looking. I'm just like, cool. See ya. You know, I just like go back to hiding in the appliances or refrigerator section or something. Uh, well, one day my, my boss saw this. This is again at like 8.15 a.m. My boss at the time saw this, and he's like, Jonathan, dude, <laughs> come here, man. Like, we need to talk. He's like, what was that? I'm like, dude, like, cut me some slack, man. It's Sunday. It's 8 o'clock. He, he said he, he's just looking or whatever. He's like, dude, you didn't talk to him about black tie protection. You didn't talk to him about financing. You didn't talk to him about the aspect ratio, contrast, resolution. At the time, 1080p was like the shit, man. It was when 1080p first became a thing, like gold, the gold-tipped HDMIs. <laughs> so, anyways, I'm not going to sell y'all some Best Buy crap right now. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, gold-tipped HDMIs. He was like, he's like, dude, you need to, this is your job, right? And I was like, lay off, man. I'm warming up. He's like, bro, you don't need to be warming up with these customers. I'm paying you to already be warm. And taking this really sidebarred story back to what we're talking about here, uh, vishing cold sets you up for failure. So just like I would walk up to these customers, if put aside the fact that I was a crappy employee, if I really wanted to effectively sell TVs and stuff, walking in cold wouldn't be the way to do it. Just like whenever you're doing telephone pretexting, you need to practice your pretext, which we'll talk about later, actually choosing your pretext, before you get on the horn and start, start talking to these people. Um, I believe in state. I do feel that once you get sort of a momentum going, you'll start getting people to kind of like buy into your pretext better. However, I don't think you should rely on building state before you start making the calls. I think that you need to already have practiced your pretext, done effective recon, OSINT, chosen your pretext, know your target, and then actually make the call before actually getting on the, on the phone and then starting to make the call. Bless you.
Um, so solutions to the millennial problem, um, that's where, again, we have the headphones and the cell phones and we go in day in and day out um, doing sort of our technical jobs and not having social interactions. Put away the headphones and avoid texting in public. So for me, I'm kind of a gym rat. Like I'll go to the gym and like, I don't get me wrong, there's nothing more that I like better than like rocking out to like Pantera or Metallica on leg day. But I'll kind of wear my headphones like kind of floppy eared to where like if I see like a gym bro or something, it's like, hey, what's up, man? Like, it's like this spot. I'm like, you got me spot? You got me spot. Um, so even when I'm in these areas where I need to focus, I'll still just try, especially when I have like a, a, a some sort of SE gig coming up, I'll try to avoid being completely isolated in my own world. Another thing is communicating with people. <coughs> Something that I, I tell a lot of folks whenever they're getting involved with social engineering to strive to do, have three conversations with strangers a day. So like say you're at like a grocery store or something, like even if you're like bugging them, actually if you bug them it's even better because that puts you both in an awkward situation. And believe me, there's plenty of awkward situations with telephone pretexting. Three conversations a day. Um, I, either way, you need to communicate with people. Now um, you can even, I even count like saying hi as a win. So if I'm just like walking on the street or something and I'm just like, hey, how's it going? And they say hi back, like it's not a conversation, but still it gets you from being in your own mind and then actually communicating with folks. Talking on the phone is another issue. Like I mentioned earlier, I rarely talk to my buddies on the phone. Like if we're hanging out or something, it's usually, or if I want to hang out with them, I'll give them a call because like they're late running to a bar or something. I'm like, dude, I'm here, like where the hell are you? Otherwise, it's just like texting, like always texting. So expecting yourself to be comfortable talking on the phone when it's not a normal medium for communication is setting the bar high. So do yourself a favor, if, especially if you have a gig coming up, call like your boyfriend, girlfriend, mom, cousin, stepmom, parents, whatever. Either way, just start talking on the phone more to get you used to doing that type of, that form of communication. Um, so I kind of put this together just to have some sort of methodology. Unfortunately, as far as I understand, there's not much of like a PTES standard for like telephone pretexting. So this is the order of about when I uh, do for preparing for pretexting. These two are kind of like interchangeable or it's kind of like a circle between OSINT and pretext dev which we'll talk about next. So to dive into this, we've talked about socializing. Um, next we'll talk about pretext development. After that we'll talk about OSINT which is reconnaissance. We'll talk about preparing for the call, the technical setup, and then finally actually executing the calls. So choosing your pretext is where we're going to kind of jump into first here. Two things you're going to need to talk to your customer about. There's amongst other things. These are two of the more important things you need to hammer out. The assessment goals and the targets, right? The assessment goals is what are they trying to accomplish from doing this engagement? Why are they why are they hiring you to trick their employees? It's pretty like malicious thing, so you need to kind of know going into it like what the hell like they're actually trying to to accomplish with it. I'll give you a great example of a time that I failed. We'll talk about all the times that I've been a failure at things so that you can hopefully learn from my idiotic mistakes. Um, one example is one time uh, we had a gig where, again, we, we, we failed to ask what the goals were, right? <coughs> and basically, um, it was for a bank. Um, and it was it was a a, um, a two phase gig. There was there was phishing and there was also telephone pretexting. It's very common, as you, a lot of you guys have seen probably before. Um, so we started everything out. Uh, we did the phishing gig. It was successful. We got like a handful of creds. We validated through their email that the creds were actually working, and they didn't just give us some like fake data type stuff. And then we started on the the, the telephone call part. So we started calling folks, and they started asking for the password of the day. And that's not something that I've run into like a whole lot before. Like literally everyone we called, first question was password of the day. And if we didn't know it, they just hang up the phone immediately. <coughs> so we're like, uh, what the hell? And then it dawned on me, whenever I was validating those creds in the email, 
I saw an email that came out from Enterprise IT that said, okay, here's the password of the day. And the rest of the email basically said that there's going to be telephone pretexting taking place over the following week. And if anyone calls, you ask them what this password of the day is. And this is what the password of the day is. So now that we knew what the password of the day was, we could do whatever the hell we wanted. We had like the, the master key. So we're just like, social security number, boom, because we knew the password of the day. It's like one, two, three, four, five. And they're literally eating out of our hand. Sorry, just so I'm clear, was that, they put that password just in advance of your engagement? Yeah. Exactly. So, a good point because that's the, I'm I'm really bad with tangents, and that's kind of tying us back into this. Because what wound up happening was they implemented this password of the day, just for this one time only, because this was for some sort of internal governance. They were wanting to sway the results, which we see all the time. Whenever we're doing internals, externals. We see this pretty often. They're trying to hide that vulnerable JBoss server. They have like this Jenkins without authentication over here on this like, you know, network segment that's like not your your typical RFC 1918 address space. It's they'll do weird stuff like that and it's no different with this. So Whenever I'm saying assessment goals, under, try to understand whenever you're having that kickoff meeting with your customer, what are they trying to accomplish? Is it for governance? Are they genuinely trying to get it better with their security program? Targets, this is a, a good segue into this one because you'll need to understand your targets as well. And this ties also a little bit in the assessment goals. Um, but for instance, have they just had a breach? Like if you're, if you're calling an insurance company and they had insurance fraud f over the phone two weeks prior and now they're wanting to see if the same folks will like do the same thing again, like they're probably going to be a little bit more on high alert. And the more you have this intel on your side going into it, the more you're able to calibrate your pretext as soon as they start giving you shit tests whenever they're not believing what you're saying. Um, so it's, it, this is really setting yourself up. These are ar areas where I've had mistakes made in the past. And again, we're talking a lot about all the areas that I've left up to hopefully help you guys succeed whenever you all get involved with some of these things. Um, have pretext to demonstrate risk in multiple ways. This is sort of a value add to your customer. Rather than being a one trick pony and just being like, oh yeah, we, uh, we called all 50 employees and got FTI from every single one of them. It's probably more value to them to see, okay, we got like FTI from like your accounting side. Whenever we're calling HR, we're able to get PII. Whenever we called um, the tech folks on the help desk, we got their passwords. So like, not only did we get domain admin, this is all over the phone by the way, we also got FTI and we got proprietary information. Like that kind of stuff is what will really set you guys apart from like your typical like puppy mill type shop that's just like generically calling however many people to get to get all the call calls done in three days. <clears throat> and as we're talking here, that's going to be one of the biggest challenges for folks that haven't gotten involved with some of this stuff. Is oftentimes you're 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 tight on time, right? So you have like, for instance, I'll give you an example. They'll give you 50 phone calls to make, they'll give you 50 numbers to call within three days. Sounds achievable, right? That's what, 15, 30? It's like 17 and a half calls a day. Half, I don't know how you call it half, half time or not, but uh, um, anyways, it's, it's basically 17 calls a day, but think about all the reconnaissance you have to do, which we'll talk about next. So a lot of times it's kind of tough to fit all of this in into um, a, a short time span. So um, we'll dive into that here in a little bit. Actually, we'll dive into it right now. <laughs> There's two main types of pretext at a very high level, and I'm hyper generalizing here. There's spearfish and there's general, right? So spearfish is where you do reconnaissance and you're targeting a specific person based off the recon that you've performed, right? So whenever you're uh, doing something like this, um, the spearfish is what you're going to talk to your customer about. A lot of times they'll be like, oh yeah, we had like, we've had a problem where like executives, for instance, were targeted and like their passwords were disclosed and they're wanting to like, for you to target executives. That's where the spearfish is going to come into play. General is going to be more of like, okay, now I have like 30 other calls to make, so I need to create like either two or three other just high level pretexts that will work for like a large chunk of numbers, pretty much. So I'm not saying burn through people with general, but it's more of a one that you can scale out to more individuals rather than one that's pinpointing a, but just a particular department, for instance. Um, an example, um, example of a spearfish, this is going to be, 
it's not that specific, but let's say, for instance, we're wanting to target the help desk. Um, one, that, one that I've seen done before that's really effective, I do this pretty commonly whenever we're going after the help desk, if the customer is wanting us to do that for, for Spearfish. And again, this isn't like heavily recon, but uh, what we've done is it's like two or three minutes before the hour. So say, for instance, it's like 4.57 or something like that. You call the help desk, and um, first, um, what I did most recently on a gig that worked like magnificently with was I found a dude on LinkedIn. He was like an executive vice president of sales. He'd only been there for like three months. And it's nice to choose someone who's not been there for very long because, because you can always play the card like, oh, I don't know, like I just started or something stupid like that if you get like in a bind. So that, I wound up having to pull that card because I called the help desk. Um, again, this is like at 4.57, like minutes before the hour. Uh, and, and you know, it's like, like, this is Steve from the help desk, how may I help you? And then it's just like, Hey, this is uh, Jim, the executive vice president from sales. Uh, how's it going, Steve? And like, Steve's just like, oh, I'm doing good. How are you doing, man? How can I help you? And so Jim, the vice president's like, look, dude, I have a meeting in three minutes, right? My password, winter 2018, is not working. And I have some very important slides that I need out of there. Can you please change my password back to winter 2018? And so that's Jim. So going back to Steve on the help desk, Steve's like, Whoa, 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 whoa. I know, important meeting, I got it. I know, executive VP, blah, 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 I've already looked you up, but I need to identify you somehow. What is your employee ID? And going back to Jim, I, I'm just like, fuck, I don't know his employee ID. It's like, uh, I just started, like I just started like three months ago. I've always signed in. I know this from their email syntax, from like the point of contact. My first initial last name. Like I don't know what my employee ID is. I'm on the road like 99% of the time. I don't even have my badge. That's the next thing he asked was a badge ID. It's like, dude, I, I never go inside the building. Like, pff, I, I don't even know what that effing thing's at. And he's like, okay, cool. Well, all right, so uh, just give me one second. I'm like, dude, make it hurry, man. I, have, I now have two and a half minutes. You're wasting my time, kind of. Like, I need, this is a multi-million dollar sales meeting that we have coming up, and like, I need those slides, dude. Winter 2018, make it happen. And like, so going back to Steve, he's just like, uh, he's kind of confused. He's like, dude, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm, I'm bum rushing this dude on the phone. He's wanting to do the right thing which is not to change the password. Um, and he's like, okay, uh, now, okay, Jim, what is your manager's name? I didn't know that either. I was like, dude, what is your manager's name? ID is done right now. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, shit. Uh, he's like, uh, it's, uh, it's, hang, hang on one second, Jim. Uh, it's like, okay, and he started talking really quietly in the phone. He's like, okay, do uh, you have your email open? I'm just like, yeah, it's open, man, hurry. <laughs> and he's like, okay. A S D F one two three four exclamation. Try that. I have the VPN open. I'm just like A S D F one two three four and like connected. I'm in internal IP. I was like. Seriously, you're the man. I appreciate it, dude. Employee of the month, you got my nomination. And uh, he's like, perfect, dude. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, after your meeting, good luck with meeting, by the way, change your password to something more secure, okay? I was just like, thanks a ton, Steve. Like, seriously, you are the best. And that, that was basically the end of the conversation. So you can kind of see where Spearfish is a little bit it's going to require a little bit more time. It's going to require a little bit more reconnaissance. That's not too much recon that I did on my side with that one. But do understand that for general, you're going to want one that's more generic to like multiple departments. Like for instance, you're pretending to be Steve from the help desk, the guy that we just pwned. And then you're calling all sorts of other people, telling them that like maybe there's like, like suspicious activity on their with their account, and then you now have this like cloud online scanner where they can like log in to remotely scan their machine to make sure that they're not like hosed by China or something. That's a good generic one that you can call like finance, you can call purchasing, you can call HR, you can call multiple departments using that one same pretext, as opposed to the help desk one. We're calling the help desk because it's targeted towards them specifically. So those are the two types of pretexts that you're probably going to be wanting to use whenever you're developing. Um, Developing these guys. Teach me how to Dougie. Um, reconnaissance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, recon, recon and pretext development are kind of hand in hand. Recon takes a lot of time, right? And I'm not saying don't. I'm not saying cut corners. You know, it's there's no doubt about it. It takes a long, long time. This is part of the reason why pretexting is so challenging is because of how long this step takes. And this is also the main reason a lot of times people fail whenever they're making telephone calls. 
So whenever you're um, doing reconnaissance, obviously OSINT's super important. You're using publicly available resources to figure out information about people. Facebook, LinkedIn, Spokio, Multigo, tools like that you can learn about people. Like for instance, I use LinkedIn whenever we're talking about uh, Jim, the executive vice president earlier, to figure out that he had only been there for like three months. And we use that to understand, okay, if we get in a bind and we have to calibrate somehow, I can just back out and just be like, dude, and play stupid, because I know that he hasn't been there for very long. Um, a couple of things here. Um, people interests. Whenever you're doing, this is really also important whenever you're doing that spear phishing like we were just talking about. So if you're calling someone in particular, right, your, the ultimate goal here is to increase their buying temperature. And you increase their buying temperature by building rapport. These people want to help you so bad. Like literally, they want you to pwn them. They want to help. However, you're literally calling them as like a stranger. They're taking you at your word of who you say you are. You could be anybody, but naturally people are suspicious over the phone. Like they, but they seriously, they want to believe you. So this right here is key for building that rapport and getting them to do whatever it is that you want them to do. Uh, a couple examples, like people, interests. Say for instance you're calling someone in Chicago. Um, it's, uh, you, you look the dude up on Facebook. Um, it's one of the people who you're trying to target. You find out that he's like a Chicago Cubs fan. He's a fan of baseball, right? Uh, and you look up, okay, you're looking up Chicago Cubs, and you see that the Cubbies just got their ass kicked by like the Red Sox, for instance, you know? And you know, he's from Chicago, and you call him up, ring, 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 ring. It's like, hey, this is David from Purchasing. Um, how may I help you? And you're just like, hey, this is, uh, this is Steve from the help desk again. Not, not again, but again, and that's not in the conversation here. Yeah, this is uh, Steve from the help desk. Uh, uh, how's it going, man? And then, you know, David from purchasing is like, ah, oh, doing all right, man. You can kind of tell he's down because Cubby's just got their ass kicked. And you're just like, and he's like, how are you doing? And then, like, Steve from the help desk is like, oh, man, I'm doing pretty good. I'd be doing a lot better if the Cubs didn't get their freaking asses kicked last night. And he's like, oh, dude, I know what you mean, man. That game was intense. Went to, like, the 11th inning, blah, blah, blah. Right there, that's built a little bit of rapport. So you're increasing that buying temperature because now it's a comfortable conversation that he's okay with and familiar with, as opposed to you just being some freaking stranger off the street talking to him over the phone, and he's just taking you at your word. Uh, and it doesn't have to be sports, you know, you can make it whatever. For instance, like, I don't know, uh, you're calling someone like, there could be like a dog show going on in like Tallahassee, Florida, and you're calling somebody and you see that she's like totally into dogs, she's got all this like dog crap on her Facebook, or you're like on LinkedIn, she's posting like all sorts of stuff about dogs and just crap like that. And there's this dog show that's going on in Tallahassee, and you see that just happened or whatever, and like you call her up and then you say like, oh, I'm tired because I just went to this dog show. And she's like, no way, I wanted to go to that, but I didn't make it, blah, 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 and just like, Oh yeah, it's crazy, <laughs> like, dog show. <laughs> That's a great way in, like, just by doing that, she now not exactly trusts you, but again, this is like one more layer of that rapport that you've just built with her, because it's a familiar conversation that you can have with her, and that's, this is where you gotta get super creative. Like, the sky is the limit as far as how creative you can get with some of these. Like, th this, is, this is where you'll hear the stories from people doing, like, the war stories and talks and stuff, and you're just like, holy crap, how did that work? This right here, is why recon is one of the more important components whenever you're doing your pretext development. So mapping your recon back over to your pretext will help you also to kind of shortcut and save a little bit of time as opposed to just generically doing recon on all these people and making this huge OneDrive. I'm sorry, uh, OneNote document. <laughs> OneNote document. So uh, anyways, localities is a good one. So seeing what local events, the dog show in Tallahassee is a great example. New restaurants nearby, call on someone um, from some department and you, you see that there's like a restaurant that was just built around the corner saying like you want to check it out. They're like, oh dude, I went there like yesterday, blah, blah, blah. Some sort of relatability that you can get with these people um, will help you to um, sort of build that rapport with them. Building numbers is kind of cool to know too. Um, if they are at a campus, a lot of times what I've found is that people would be like, oh, what building are you at? Because if it's like, like for here, for instance, if we're at, say for instance, we're doing telephone pretexting for Pell, they're gonna, people are going to be like, oh, what building are you in? If you don't know, it's not a big deal, but it will help build that report. Because you can always just back out of it like I did with the, with the HR dude, where I was just like, I just started, like, uh. But if I was able to be like, oh, dude, this is my manager's name. This is my employee ID. It would have gotten a little bit more successful. But there's the calibration stuff we'll talk about later for bypassing those types of things. But it's helpful to know 
things such as building numbers, especially if they're on a campus or if they're in like a high rise and there's like a multi floored type facility, if that makes sense. Um, so, preparation. This is going to be the stuff just like public speaking. Rehearse it with a colleague or a buddy or your parents or something. Rehearse it in front of somebody, right? Um, ultimately, we're going to skip three bullet points and just get to the bottom. You want to be congruent with your pretext. You don't want it to look like you've, like, A, that it's scripted. B, you need to make it look like you know what you're doing. And it just needs to, like, flow naturally, if that makes sense. I, when I, Summer's laughing, but whenever I first started doing this, I sucked so badly at telephone pretexting because I didn't do any of this stuff. I was just horrible at it. Um, she and I used to warm up together and it was just bad. Like, uh, it was, it's kind of embarrassing times looking back on it now, but it's because I didn't know how to prepare. So once you prepare just like you would for, pub, uh, for public speaking, it'll increase that flow of how you sort of project yourself across uh, some of your targets. Um, understand that humans are paradoxical. Whenever I say that, um, I've said this word a few times, calibration is kind of key. No matter how much you prepare, no matter how smooth and how flowing the conversation is going, there's always that one person that's going to be like, no, bro, like I don't believe anything that, not just I don't believe anything that you're telling me, I just don't believe anything that anyone tells me over the phone. Like this is the kind of guy that's like, you go to his place, you guys ever watch Better Call Saul? It's like the brother, I forgot his name, uh, Saul Goodman's brother, where like, he doesn't even like, go out in public, like everything's like, the walls are wrapped in like, tin foil and like, no electronics, like, that kind of stuff. Like, there's always that dude. And so understand that no matter how prepared you get, you need to bear in mind that mentality of outcome independence to where even if someone tells you no, or they shit test you, or whatever, there's always going to be one person. Even like, like Dave Kennedy or Jason Street or like Chris Hadnagy, some of these, some of these like top dogs, even them going against some of these people are still going to have struggles. Um, so understand um, there's that, that one amount of people that uh, are kind of tough to, to get around. But either way, that's fantastic news for them because that proves good security for those guys. So it's a, either way, it's a data point. It goes in the report as a positive observation. Um, improv meetups are fantastic. I will be honest with you, I've not gone to improv, but I would like to because I can 100% see why improv is kind of important for, for doing this stuff. I mean, whenever you're having to like play off someone giving you shit tests or they start asking you questions or they're, they're doing things to like make you feel uncomfortable, having good improvisation skills is pretty nice. Pretty nice. I'm not the greatest at it, but I can kind of wing it usually and sometimes do okay. Other times, like, ends horribly. <laughs> uh, that's the funnest part about doing this type of work is that it's, it's definitely not like a trudge. Every call is, is amazingly different than the last one. Uh, and we talked about um, being congruent and outcome, depend outcome independent from the results that you get back from the folks that you're talking to. So we'll talk about um, technical setup now. Um, this is where you're going to want to spoof your, your caller ID, obviously. Whenever you're calling people, don't call them on your cell phone. Uh, they're going to call you back. Uh, you might have Enterprise IT calling you back. I, this has never happened to me, but you might have the police calling you back. <laughs> I don't think that would happen, but uh, either way, just try to change your number. A, so they don't call you back on your own personal line, and B, to make it seem more legit whenever you're calling from an internal phone number as opposed to some like 512 number in Austin or something. Um, a few different technologies for doing that. You guys are probably familiar with the majority of these. Um, I would say Asterisk PBX is my favorite, but I'm kind of, it's, it's because I've been doing a lot of research lately with Asterisk, and we'll talk about that in a second. But if you don't want to, or don't have the capability of standing up your own PBX server, you can use a burner phone, you can use Google Voice, um, you can use Spoof Card. For instance, Spoof Card is a mobile app. You can download um, both iOS and Android. It's kind of expensive, and honestly, with an Asterisk PBX, you can do anything with Asterisk that you can do with Spoof Card. Um, that's voice changing, that's recording, which is also be ca really careful with that. Uh, and then um, also caller ID spoofing. Uh, other technical setup is the cred harvesting portal. We talked about that a little bit earlier about the general pretext whenever you're calling folks, for instance. A great example is uh, the, the online cloud scanner that you're using for people to scan their machines. 
uh, you'll have to set up that cred um, harvesting portal. You can use uh, Rapid7, Metasploit Pro. You can use that. We sell that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, SE Toolkit's another one that's free. And Dave Kennedy did that trusted seg. So it's built into Kali, SE Toolkit. It'll, it'll clone a login portal. Um, so it'll, it'll go out and grab the HTML and then rehost it. And then it automatically sets up, I don't know if it uses JavaScript or PHP, I think JavaScript, I want to say, to capture those creds and save it to a file locally. Uh, weaponized documents, so like macros, follow that kind of jazz. You guys are familiar with a lot of this stuff probably, so whether it's like Excel DDE or like macro list type payloads, those are a little bit more popular these days. So up your listeners on your C2 server, and then background noise. So background noise is things like if you're pretending to be calling from a call center, having like a YouTube video up of call center noise in the background can like just kind of just that one little added layer of them believing everything that you're saying. So it, it helps and those once you kind of stack up those little things enough, that's when people are just kind of eating at your hand. They're just like, okay, this dude's telling the truth. I'll help you out. And people, I'm telling you, people want to help you out. You just have to build that rapport with them to get them to actually trust you. So we released a blog post recently. Um, this is for spoofing your card. It's kind of like, it's very like how to build your own potato gun-esque <laughs> type title. Uh, so it's a little sketchy, but uh, I'm telling you, I, I personally like asterisk the most. You can scale it out. If you guys are doing a lot of calls over long periods of time, this might be a better route to go. It costs like, you can throw it up, there's an EC2 image for free PBX, so it's like already rolled up into a, uh, into an image for you. You just gotta set it up with your service provider. It's about 10 bucks a month to host it uh, in AWS. So anyways, uh, that's a, if you want to learn how to do that, on our, just go to the Rapid7 blog. This is like a month ago, so you have to scroll down a little bit. But either way, it'll teach you how to do that type of stuff so you don't have to do things like pay for spoof card or set up dynamic, all these um, phone numbers with like Google Voice, things like that. So it's kind of cool. Making the calls. Um, <laughs> So yeah, this is the part you might you might get challenged. This is that's where folks will come back and they're just like, okay, like they'll start asking questions to identify who you are. Um, you you need to uh, adjust and calibrate um, and adjust your pretext accordingly. So things that you can do um, is what's called asking softball questions. So say for instance you're you're Steve from the help desk and you're calling folks. Um, and whenever you're calling them, you ask them like a stupid question that you know the answer to already. Um, or you can ask them a question you don't know the answer to. So I'll give you two examples of that. If you're calling like, let's say Susie from HR, you look Susie up on Facebook. You find out what her like mother's maiden name is, or that's, that's actually a bad example. You find out, you find out what her, somehow what her badge ID is. Maybe you're on Facebook and you like zoom in enough and you can see like what her badge ID is. And you use that as like an identifying method. So what that does is, so you call it up, like, hey, this is Steve from Help Desk. Before we proceed with this conversation, I need to identify you first. Is this your badge number? And it's like a five-digit number. And she's like, all right, hold on, let me check. She's like looking at her badge ID. Yep, that's it. And then it's just like, okay, cool, now we can proceed. That right there establishes a little bit of trust with her because now she feels like you've identified her. So she feels like there's processes in place to identify her before moving forward in the conversation. Another one, which is kind of funny, uh, going back to the example that we talked about earlier, whenever uh, we were calling the folks that, uh, we were calling the folks and they were doing the password of the day thing. We later did work with them again, and whenever this other tester was calling, he pretended to be helped us and asked them what the password of the day was. So now he knew the password of the day. So we've gotten it through email on one gig, and they were pissed about that, by the way. The second time we got it was over the phone when someone disclosed, to, disclosed it to us. So asking them information as well, well is like a hilarious way of like getting information from them by just simply asking and pretending to use that as some form of like identification to create that rapport over the phone. Um, we've talked about building rapport. Um, don't hang up mid-call unless you have to. There was one time uh, I was, this, this actually happened two times. Um, the, the first time I was pretending to be a help desk technician I'm sorry it keeps revolving back to help desk, but those are like the best examples. <laughs> um, and this company only had like three people that were working the help desk there, right? So I was like pretending to be one of them. It was whatever his name was. Uh, I called someone from another department and they were, they were immediately suspicious. They're like, who'd you say your name was? And I'm just like, 
Steve, <laughs> you know me, help desk, come on. And she's like, okay, one second. She puts me on hold. She brings it back up, and I'm, I'm three-wayed in with Steve. So it's like, Steve, Steve, and then the HR lady or whatever. <laughs> it's like, she's like, oh, Steve, uh, and Steve, you're talking to Steve also from help desk. And I was like, huh. <laughs> Click. Like, I didn't know what to say. It was just like, uh, dude. <laughs> it's, that, was, that was a weird situation. So, I mean, it happens. You know, just try not to hang up because what, what happens after that is they probably they send out a staff wide email saying, dude, we're, if you get any suspicious calls, just hang up immediately and notify Enterprise IT Security. So, you don't want to hang up because that's how you raise suspicion. Another example of that um, also. Um, a help desk scenario was, this was recent, this was a, just a few months ago. We're doing phone calls and we're pretending to be like this one dude from help desk and we, we, didn't, we didn't do enough recon to realize that the dude that we're calling from the help desk was in the same office as, I'm sorry, the dude that we're calling like as, like we're posing as, worked in the same office as the target that we're calling. So we call and we're pre pretending to be the person and like things are going okay and then we notice like halfway through the conversation she's like kind of like getting suspicious and she puts us on hold again and she picks it back up and she's like okay I don't, I don't think that you're actually Steve because Steve is standing right next to me. <laughs> I'm just like uh, I, half of me wants to be like, it's like from Terminator 2 where the dude can like pretend to be someone else. It's just like, run, run, you know, <laughs> get out of there. Uh, uh, but that's, I wasn't creative at the time, I just hung up. So, uh, that it happens sometimes, it's just move along, let your customer know if something like that happens, like hey, you might get a notification. Either way, what you, what you can also do to turn that around. Uh, is if something like that happens to where a staff-wide email gets sent out to your customers, you can turn that around with your point of contact and be like, it's positive observation, you know, while this pretext was burned, we can fortunately move from it because we've chosen other pretexts to go off of and we'll mark this down into our report again as a positive observation saying that folks actually went through with the reporting chain and notified other individuals as they should have according to y'all's policy. So it's always good with the bad. Uh, so talking about some remediation stuff real quick, um, obviously testing your employees is going to be something that, um, that you're going to want to do to prevent them from falling for these ruses. Uh, so some form of like regu um, regular audits or maybe you have like internal testing. I don't know if anyone here has internal security or not, but this is what we offer to, to our folks is test them on a frequent basis, predefined, you know, maybe quarterly internal, then annual have Rapid7 come out and do it for you. Again, selling our products. Um, but either way, just have like predefined times that you're actually testing your employees and have samples from every department. And then, you know, of course, uh, different folks are going to want to have different types of training as well. So that's going to dive into the security awareness training. Folks that are doing like insurance claims over the phone should probably receive a different type of training than folks that are, you know, managing, managing the help desk. So they'll have the, the general social awareness, or I'm sorry, security awareness training, and then they'll have like their role-based security training. So again, insurance folks gets their own custom training, whereas other folks such as like executives have their own custom training as well. Just two examples. And that being said, that's that's the it. that's the end rather. <laughs> um, are there any any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have questions for you, sir. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> two. Uh, you were saying uh, you had some examples earlier where you hung up. Knowing what you know now, how would you have stayed on the phone and kind of talked your way out of it? I have, yeah. It kind of, it kind of hurts a little bit, and still thinking about it because it's so uncomfortable. Like, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Kind of those situations. Uh, but yeah, doing, I would have done more recon on those situations. Like for instance, whenever we're calling, posing as like the the IT guy who's working in the same office as the lady, I would have changed that completely. Like I. That's something you should try not to do if you can. This is a really large company, like I'm like Microsoft or somebody, where it's just like thousands of employees. Um, but to generically answer the question, more recon for sure um, for doing those those types of calls. Does that make sense? So there was like no way out of it outside of paying up. 
I, in that situation, it was kind of my fault. In both those scenarios, it was it was kind of my fault to even be put in that situation. It would have been tough. Like maybe there could have been a way. Like that that could have been a good one. So that's calibration component. So calibrating better would have been another another way of of getting out of it. And I'm just kind of like slow sometimes, like panic mode. Hang up the phone now. <laughs> Uh, but like, you're right, though. Calibrating would have would have been a great way of a much better way of getting out of that rather than burning my entire pretext. Um, but that's a, that's a good point. That could have worked too. Yeah. This you see, that's that's a, actually a, both of those are fantastic. Much better than hanging up. Yeah. Whitney. Another question. Um, so how do you recover from like really hard calls? Because there was one, like, the company was very, very well prepared, and no matter what I said, I mean, it was good for them, it was really bad for me. Yeah. Um, that no matter how much we said, I, I was getting yelled at, I was getting cursed at, I was getting hung up on it. Again, great for them, really bad for me. How do you come back from, you know, failures or, or calls just really didn't go well? Like, how do you come back and get yourself back on the phone? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, because that's something I struggle with, too. Um, earlier, we were talking about outcome independence. You have to always detach your ego from making the calls. No matter if, they're, if, if the call goes really well, it's like, great, it, that call went really well. As opposed to like, <sighs> like, you know, it's nice to celebrate and stuff, but like, at the same time, it's, it, it's, um, there's a um, book by Eckhart Tolle. Um, it's called The Power of Now. And he talks, and not, I'm sorry for preaching about Eckhart Tolle right now, but it's really focusing and staying focused on the moment as opposed to focusing on like the, whether it's both a negative impact or a positive impact for you. And everyone's different. My way of dealing with it is focusing on the present moment. It's a little woo-woo for some people. Um, Chris Hadnagy writes about that too. Um, a lot of times, you know, you have like inner dialogue. He says to dial back the inner dialogue whenever you're making phone calls and focus, try to focus all of your attention on the conversation at hand. So just try not to think too much Try to be detached from outcome. Try to detach your ego also from outcome. And if it's like a negative thing, like don't think like, what could I have done better? Like analyze it later, like after the gig. But just press forward. And you still need to, of course, you'll have to um, fix things. You know, maybe you, maybe it does need some sort of calibration. But don't judge yourself type thing. That's what I, this is all for me. This is what I have to do. Um, and once I realize that, it helps me like tremendously, if that makes sense. Yeah. Also, if your mindset is you only succeed if you crush the other side, then you're going to be crushed if you don't okay. do it, right? But if your mindset is, hey, I'm testing their security, and the outcome could be either way. You know, if their security is good, that means you don't get through. Then you don't feel as bad after the call, right? Yeah. Well, I try to be, like, happy for them, but it's so really hard when, like, you're getting yeah. cursed out on the phone to be like, I'm really happy for you. <laughs> yeah. And it's working. Dude. <laughs> There you go. That's a good one. So, Ice cream. <laughs> At the end of the day, aren't you just you're, you're, you're an actor, right? So if you take that theatrical mindset, how do, how do actors not fall victim to becoming a character, right? So Dude. If you're an actor in that situation. Make it transactional. You walk away. Right? Dude. Uh, it's over. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's it's funny because in the same vein with that, it's like uh, like actors sometimes become their characters. So they're kind of like jerks. Like there's one with Jim Carrey recently. His uh, uh, Andy. Maybe, uh, Andy uh, it's a oh, yeah. So did you, have you guys seen the the documentary on on Netflix? Like he actually becomes the character. He's like such a dick. Like no one really enjoys being around him because he's so much in tune. That's a good point though because I I think that's hundred percent accurate. Any other questions, Joe? You, uh, you talked about voice changing on Asterisk. Uh, I, I tried out voice changing on like spoof card or whatever, and it all sounded pretty fake. Um, so have you ever used that on an actual engagement, and has it worked, and what do you recommend? It's funny you're bringing that up, because next week I'm slated to do research with that. Because there's, um, there's a module um, for Asterisk called Lib Sound Touch. I've never used it before, but I'm trying to roll it into our current like production spoofer. Um, 
I've never, Summer, have you ever played around with the voice change with um, well, I've Spoof only Car? Had a spoof card and I've tried to change my voice to a man's voice. <laughs> but I've been told, I think I called you with it. I'm trying to remember, I thought. You sound like a heavy set woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I use it to change my voice, but I don't play a man with it. My, I guess my voice is too high to bring it down. And I even tried to like change it to a girl's voice. And I just can't do it. Yeah. And it still, then it sounds robotic. So I, gotcha. I haven't had luck with it other than just making my voice. Make me sound like another woman, especially if I'm doing health tests. But it still sounds human. It doesn't sound like it's fake or distorted. It still sounds human. Okay. And I use the background. I think I used the airplanes or the, the terminal background noise okay. as well. Um, but yeah. And that's usually what I use. It was, it was distorted when you were going from like man to woman type yeah, voice changing? I tried it out and it didn't sound right. It's just like suspicious type thing. Let me call them. Um, they may have, have to put you on another server because I've had like okay. bad connections and I've contacted their tech support. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'd like to set up the internal infrastructure, but I do it on the road. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'm a rich person. I need this now. <laughs> I'll, I'm super interested to see how this library works with Asterisk. I've never played around with it or anything, but. We'll see. It, everything that I'm doing is will be released in this blog post too. So if you're ever interested in circling back, it it'll probably be a few months from now. But if you're wanting to change change it up.